you see how we finished that? Right when the music stopped, I was able I just come right up. We worked on it. How long did we work on that, Ralph? You're, you're, you're really good. I mean, yeah, he's really good. He's been playing that piano now for a little while. What a blessing to be able to worship together tonight. Welcome to our services. Isn't it great to be able to join together? Man, it's just a... Sir? Well, no, I, Peyton Manning, I, I, somebody said he got detention for being in the hall or something. I don't know. I just, I, I, don't, pay, I don't pay no money. We uh, do have several things I want to remind you of. Please don't forget about uh, um, our WANA starting on the 18th and uh, then our whitewater rafting trip. Uh, that sign up ends today. So if you want to go on that, and it's ages 12 and up that we can do that for. So uh, please make note of that. Um, also, um, we are going to be postponing our, our fishing camp just for a little while and, and uh uh, just out of some caution, we're just watching what numbers are doing for that. So uh, just keep that in mind. We do ha- I want to remember those in prayer uh, that are sick. Uh, we've got uh, Larry and Amanda Hughes. Uh, also, um, Lindsay Lentz. Uh, Lindsay is home, and we praise God for that. Um, somebody I don't have on here um, is um, uh, Jacob Clark, Jake Clark. Uh, he's got COVID again, and so what is Jake in about the fifth, sixth grade? And so uh, this is his second round with it, so uh, be in prayer for him. And uh, that's that's Julie Pryor's uh, son, and, and just uh, be lifting him up in prayer. Uh, we've got several folks that have been sick, and we want to keep praying for, uh, of course, remembering Rhonda Nickel. Uh, she's home too, and we praise God for that. And so I pray for Jeff Langley as he continues to uh, improve, and uh, he's got some more surgery ahead of him, so we do want to remember him. Uh, be lifting up Miss Kay in prayer, of course, and I also appreciate you remember my brother Greg. He will be having surgery in the morning, and so he has to be at uh, Good Samaritan Hospital in Cincinnati, and I think it's at 5 o'clock in the morning, so appreciate your prayers for him, and uh, uh, he's he's nervous, but he's excited about uh, about having this finished, so uh, also, uh, be in prayer for Harper Gentry. She'll be having ear surgery on Wednesday. Um, and I know we've got folks here in our sanctuary with somebody on your heart. If you've got somebody on your heart, just raise your hand. We've got many here all over our sanctuary. And as we go, Lord, in prayer, I'm going to ask if, uh, Brother Zach, would you mind opening some word of prayer? Audrey and Jean are. He did. Bless his heart. We'll be able to remember them in prayer as well, Audrey and Jean. Thank you for letting me know. Ladies and gentlemen, we start our service tonight. 
sing just a little talk with Jesus. Boy, that was moving, wasn't it? I almost need a, an oxygen break before I get started. Whoo! <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. If you will tonight, turn, your, turn with your copy of God's Word over with me to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. 1 Peter chapter 3, looking at verse 15. 1 Peter Chapter 3, looking at verse 15. If I could title the sermon tonight, it'd be a heart of love. A heart of love. And that, that's for all of us, uh, that the Lord challenges our heart to love others. The way, that, uh, the way that we ought to love others. The way He sees them. And you know, it's, sometimes it's hard, to, it's hard to see folks that way, isn't it? It's hard to see them the way He sees them. Because too often we look on the outside and too often we, we kind of judge others by an appearance or maybe by the way they, they, they act or the way they, uh, they look. I, I know uh, um, there's been some folks that, that uh, over the years that uh, the Lord's put me in contact with that, shoo, you just you see them and you think, Boy, I think I've told you the story about the guy that I worked with before that he was all scraggly looking, real scrawny looking fella. And, and uh, he, he had a, a little goatee that it, he didn't grow, but about four or five hairs. He couldn't grow that much of a goatee. And he was just a real scrawny fella. And he had arms about that big around, but he had a big tattoo of a skull and crossbones. And he was wearing a top hat on his arm and uh, I mean there was a couple things that come to mind I thought man that tattoo artist had to be a pretty good shot to hit all that on that one little bitty bone he had there but that and and he just he had some of the worst language of anybody I ever knew and so I just tried to stay away from him that's what I tried to do and, and we worked together for a month and and again I just tried not to say anything and then one night he said, aren't you supposed to be one of them Christians? Boy, that hit me kind of wrong there. And I said, yes, I am. I thought, we're going we're gonna to tussle right now. I knew it was going to come. I, I thought, you say something bad about my Lord, and you and I are going to have problems right here. 
And he looked at me and he said, we've worked together for a month. And I said, yeah. And he said, how come you ain't never said nothing to me about, about Jesus? Mm. You see, he wasn't saying nothing about my Lord. He was convicting me that I wasn't witnessing the way I ought to have been witnessing. And I thought, oh boy, you want to know, I love to tell you. And I told him about Jesus. I started right then. And I mean, I told him all about what the Lord had done in my life. And that evening in the parking lot of that factory where I worked, after we got off work, so it was early in the morning, he gave his heart to Jesus. And he said, my wife's got to hear this. And he said, can you come to my house? And we drove to his house. And he woke his wife up and he said, you got to hear this. And she gave her heart to Jesus that night. Boy, I about missed it, you know. I was really convicted. That was one of the things that have, have, have stuck with me. It has. I almost missed an opportunity. Here we are in 1 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 15. Out of reverence for God's word, if you're able, I invite you to join me in standing as I read here. This is what God's word said in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and in fear. Join me in prayer. Father God, I pray that you just might encourage us tonight. Lord, that as we leave this place, we do so with a spirit of, uh, of power and a spirit of strength and a spirit of love. God, that as we go from here, that it, it is a magnet that draws those that are, that are seeking. Lord, that they see something in our life that they want and they see something in our life that they need. And God, I pray that you just might help us, Lord, to, to be that witness that you'd have for us wherever we go. Lead us and direct us, we pray, to a point of decision in our life. For it's in the name of Jesus, I ask it. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. Why do we have hope? You know, why do we have, have hope? Well, for us, if we've come to know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, we have hope because Jesus died in our place. That's where our hope stems from, doesn't it? That we have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, his son, knowing that he said that, that no man cometh unto the Father but by me, that he is the only way. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's, the, he's it. He is the only path. That is the, that is the basis of our hope. As, as we see this, this heart of love, it, it, it comes, the, the love that we have stems out of the hope that we've received from Jesus Christ, that relationship that we have in him. And that gives us the peace of knowing that, that we have an eternity uh, awaiting for us in heaven, uh, that, that we have escaped the punishment that's, that's due us, that we're due. That he, he took the penalty for our sins because he loved us and he cared for us. He is the one that, that, that sacrificed everything for you and for me. He's the one that, that makes all the difference in everything that we do. Now, this past week, um, I was out on the interstate driving. And as I'm out on the interstate driving, and, and I, I do a lot of driving, I do. I'm out on the road a lot. And so, but it gives me time to pray and it gives me time to, to make phone calls and different things while I'm driving. So I'm out on the road and uh, as I'm driving, uh, I'm, y'all know one of those Clayton homes? I, I, I say, that's just the, that's just the, the term that, you know, they were driving half of a house. Okay. There was another half that was ahead of, ahead of us, but I mean, they were moving a house. That's what they were doing. And so um, I'm out there on, on the interstate driving, and um, I'm passing. He's over here on the left side. Now, I don't know if you've seen those big homes. I'm sure you have, but they're more than one lane. 
So he's over, he's got his lane, and then he's got all the shoulder too. That's what he's got. And so there I am driving my little, you know, I'm going on down the road, and, and uh, I'm passing him, and I notice just out of the corner of my eye that he's getting closer to me. I'm, I mean, I'm in that right-hand lane. I'm almost up to the cab of the truck. There's a car behind me, and he's getting closer and closer. He's really liking my, my right fender about this time. And, and he's, he's getting closer and closer. So I get a little farther and a little farther. You know, it's, I'm to the point where I've already run through those little, brrr, those, you know, those bump things that you go through. And that's, that's the technical term for it, like brrr, as you're driving, y'all. And so as I'm driving through, the, and I mean, I'm already passing. I'm almost in the grass before he realizes where I'm at. And so I'm slamming on my brakes. The car behind me is honking his horn, trying to get his attention, where he pulls back over in his lane and the other guy's lane and not ours. And so there I am. And, you know, I'm at a point there where I'm almost about to have to choose whether I'm going to have to go down that hill, uh, you know, there get in the grass to try to get away from him or let him hit me and then knock me down in the grass. That was, and I thought to myself in that instant, I, of course, I'm thinking, you know, I know that there's folks that have contacted their insurance company and said, I have run into a house, but I don't know how many have contacted their insurance company and said, our house ran into me. You know, I don't think that's, that's one of those common things. But there I am, I'm at the point of, of having to make a decision. What am I going to do? Because I'm almost in a panic. Have you all ever been to that spot where you're almost in a panic? You, you know, you can't go much farther this way. That's where folks are in their life without Jesus Christ. The danger's coming to them on every side and they get to this point in their life where they're in a panic. They have no place else to go and they're looking for something to change the circumstance that they're in. And only Jesus does that. Only a relationship with Christ. You see, we deserved hell. That's what we earned. And Jesus sacrificed everything so that we wouldn't have to spend eternity separated from God. And there's a lot of folks in our world that are at this point in their life and they're looking for some sort of hope because they're, they're boxed in on every side and there's nowhere else to go. And they're going to look for us. And they're going to ask that question, why do you have hope and I don't? Why do you have that happy spirit about you? Because I don't have it. That's what they're saying. They're looking for something that, that, that they know they don't have. They're looking for the source of that. So it brings us to that point of why do we have hope? Because we've been made a new creature in Christ. We've been made a brand new man, a brand new creature. Now I'm going to tell you what, I love babies. I loved when, my, when mine were little. I loved it. I remember the, the first time I ever got to hold my Kaylin. Bless her heart, she was little. I could hold her in one hand. I mean, she wasn't. In fish terms, she was right there at that release point. I mean, she, I had, but she was, she, I kept her though. I didn't throw her back. So, but she was little, just little bitty. I could hold her in one hand. <clears throat> I've got a picture that's hanging up on the wall of that little bitty hand wrapped around my finger. And she couldn't get all the way around my finger, her, her hand, just little bitty. Man, I remember those days where I got to hold them and I thought, man, oh man, you could just eat them up, huh? You know, uh, when we were on vacation, we went to, we went to one of my favorite places, my, my favorite author, Mark Twain. Uh, he was my favorite author growing up. And, and so I, Crystal, she worked out our schedule to where we got to go to his hometown. And, uh, and got to spend a couple days there in Hannibal, Missouri. And one of the things he said is, he said, when a baby is born, he said, you ought to put them in a pickle barrel and feed them through the knot hole. 
And then he said, and when they turn a teenager, you ought to plug up the knot hole, is what he said. But, but I remember those days holding it, and I would think, man, how wonderful is this? That, that new baby. And we got home with Kaylin, and, and I looked over at Crystal, and she looked over at me, and we said, what now? <laughs> You know, they didn't give us the manual. They left that out when they packed all of our stuff and sent us home from the hospital. Wow. And I think about, I watched her and I watched all the things. I, her, those little eyes were so bright and, and the things that she would learn and pick up on. And, and th- I mean, it was incredible to watch the brightness in those eyes when, when she would learn something. And boy, at that age, she was just soaking it all in too. You know, you could just see it. All the things that she was learning and, and how I love that. And then I, I remember the days that she learned things that probably weren't so good and I'd have to discipline her over. And I want to tell you, as much fun as I had playing and watching her, I didn't have near as much fun when I had to discipline her. And I can't help but think about a God that loved us so much to give us his only son to die on a cross for our sins so that we could be made new again. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, isn't that wonderful to know that all things have become new, that we begin with a second chance. We get to start over because Jesus has completely forgiven our sins. And how great is it to know that if we mess up, that my Bible says that we would, if we would just confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That he forgives us, that he loves us, that he's got a purpose and a plan, that we begin new with him. Oh, what a great source of hope. Not only do we have Jesus as our Savior, but that all the old things that have happened in our life are passed away, that we get to begin new with our relationship with Jesus Christ. We're no longer held in that old nature. We'll begin anew with Christ. Boy, that's something wonderful. You know, uh, Lord blessed me while to grow up on a farm there in, in Kentucky, in northern Kentucky. And now, we raised tobacco. That's what we did. We, we raised tobacco, and, and, of course, we had gardens and everything else. But I remember, of course, putting in hay. It wasn't a good hay day unless it was over 100 degrees for Dad. And, you know, that's the way it was. But there it was. We, I remember working out in those tobacco fields. This is about the time we'd get cutting good you know and uh, we'd have some farmers that already get have their stuff ready to cut and 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 I'd get to work and, and cutting tobacco for a lot of the farmers around and, and we did it different up there than y'all do down here I had never heard of a team of cutters I never heard of that when we hired in up there you had to cut and you know you and had your spear you speared and 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 cut your tobacco. I didn't know that y'all did it in teams. I thought, man, I got cheated in my whole childhood. I could have had one of my buddies with me. <laughs> but that was the way it was. We we cut and speared all. And so, but I remember those days. And boy, there was one year, Daddy and, and my brother Doug had a huge crop of tobacco. I mean, it was huge. Uh, and those those leaves, of course, were great big, wide, long leaves. And uh, we'd already been through and topped them all and sprayed them all. And boy, it was hot and nasty as you walked out through there. And, and those leaves were good and th- thick and gummy. And and I remember going through, cutting the back. And at the end of the day, you know, you cut all day and you, you eat lunch and you go back out and cut again. And that's the way we did. And And then towards the evening, you start loading up a little bit of what you cut that morning and put some on the wagon to take off the night or the next morning while the dew dried off. And I remember getting home. Boy, I'm going to tell you what, I was nasty. I mean nasty. And I know, I can even right now remember how great it was to be able to get in there and, and turn that shower on 
and, and get all that, that tobacco and all the stuff out of your hair because when you're hanging in the barn, you know, it, you get nasty up in there too, all that dirt and everything else. You're just filthy and grimy. Boy, how good did it feel to be clean? Brothers and sisters, I want you to know we can have that, that great feeling of being clean spiritually. No matter how grimy we may get out of this world, no matter what we've got on us, my Bible says that if we would come to our Jesus, that he'll cleanse us. And the scripture even tells us, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow, as the scripture says it. Oh, that we can have that knowledge that we can be clean. Oh, that's why we have hope. You know why we have hope? Because heaven awaits us. <laughs> Boy, that's good, isn't it? Heaven awaits us. There was a time when the when, uh, Lord blessed me. When I was living down in Louisiana, uh, we were, I was on a committee. We were hunting for a camp for the community. Uh, kids we were going to do a youth camp. And we couldn't find a good facility to do it. And uh, there was a facility that I had heard of over in, in East Tennessee, and it was a place called Wesley Woods. Some of y'all know that area. And so I, I didn't know it. And one of the guys said, hey, uh, would you drive up there and look at it? And I said, yeah, I'll go up and look at it. So I, Wednesday night after church, I got in my car and, and took off. And I headed up to, to Wesley Woods up in Tennessee. And, and uh, boy, it was, a, it was some kind of a trip. I got up there. Uh, long story short, and it was early in the morning. I, I waited. The guy come and showed me the camp, and uh, half of those at that time they didn't have those uh, those really nice buildings built. It was just them ones out you know, that just had screens, and you had the cots and screens, and that's all you had. And I thought, man, them little girls that couldn't print them in the morning, boy, they'd be tore all to pieces. That, yeah. So. I'm over there in Wesley Woods, and, and they're calling for snow. And the guy, it had already started snowing a little bit, and the guy looked at me, and he said, they're calling for quite a bit of snow in the mountains. He said, uh, you, you might ought to find you a spot to get out of here in. And, and you know what I thought? I'm about five hours from my mom and daddy's house. And I thought, I know where I'm going. I got in that car, and I drove north, headed up, and... Uh, one of the greatest things that I can, can tell you is when I got out of that car and mom and daddy didn't even know I was coming and I opened that door and I walked into the house and I was home. You know, it's good to be home every once in a while, isn't it? I, I was home and mama, boy, she come and gave me a hug and daddy hugged on me and, and I told him how I was tired and I wanted to sleep. And mama said, oh, the bed's in there, you go ahead. And, and I went in there and got my old bed. And I didn't have to worry about nothing because mama and daddy were there. And, and, and I got up the next morning. <sighs> Ralph, you're sitting over there, so it doesn't matter. There was biscuits coming out. I could smell the bacon cooking already. And I thought, oh, man. I got up and walked. I had a big breakfast there at the house. I was home. I looked forward to being home. You know, I look forward to heaven. It's a home. A home that Jesus has prepared for us. You know, the Bible, he tells his disciples in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you into myself, that where I am there you may be also. You see, heaven awaits us. And you know, if we were to close our eyes in death, the Bible says in Psalm chapter 116, verse 15, precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints. Brothers and sisters, there's a home in heaven for me because of who Jesus is. And because of, of that relationship that I have with Him. He is my Savior. And because He's my Savior, one day I will go to heaven. I look forward to knowing I've got a home. A home that's prepared for me. And a home that awaits. Boy, I have hope. Why do we have hope? 
You know, there's a lot of folks in our world that are looking for hope. They're looking for hope, and they have to see it in a heart of love that comes out of us. You see, the Bible says that our hearts must be sanctified. Look there with me. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. God's word says this. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. You see, our hearts must be sanctified. We must have come to that saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That word sanctification means to be set apart. To be different from this world. That we're set apart because God's got a purpose and a plan for us. We are holy in the sight of God because we're his children. We're children of the king. Oh, that's a, that's a wonderful thing for you and for me. That our hearts can rejoice in. That hope that we have is because of the love that we've experienced and because we've come to know Jesus as our Savior and as our Lord. My Bible says then that prepares our hearts then to be able to give an answer for the reason of our hope. Let me ask you tonight, do you have hope? Do you have that undying hope? Oh, that today, that you and I, as we have, if we have experienced that hope, that we share it. Because we must be willing to give that answer, willing to share it with others. God's calling us. And right now, if there's ever been a time in history when, when folks need to hear about hope, it's today. It's right now. They need to know why we have hope and they need to see that hope in our heart and in our life. And we must be willing to share it. My Bible says with meekness and in fear that we share that hope with others. Oh, that Jesus loves them and that we can encourage them in their life. Why do we have hope? Why do you have hope tonight? Have you come to that saving knowledge of Jesus? Maybe you're here tonight for the first time and realize you've never invited Jesus into your heart to be your Savior and Lord. And tonight you say, I, I need Jesus. Maybe that's you tonight to step out from where you are and come and say, I want Jesus as my Savior. I want that hope in my life. Maybe you're here as a Christian and you may say in my heart and life, I've had that hope, but I've, I've not shared it the way I ought to share it. Or maybe I'm not living in it the way I ought to. Maybe I've allowed the world to, to dim the hope that I ought to have in my life. And today I just need to come kneel down at the altar and pray. Say, Lord, help me. Help me to live in that hope and help me to share that hope with those that I come in contact with. Maybe today the Lord's calling in your heart and life to make a decision for him. Maybe to say, Lord, I need to surrender to a call in my life, whatever that call may be. As the Lord leads in your life, I invite you, you come. As he moves in your heart and life tonight, that you would respond to him. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you, Lord, for your word. And as it applies to us tonight, Father, the reason of our hope. Why do we have hope? Lord, we have hope because of who Jesus is. Because of the sacrifice that was made for us on Calvary's cross. God, we're so thankful for that. To know that you love us so much. And Lord, that's my prayer tonight. If there's someone here that doesn't know the Jesus that I know. And has experienced the hope that I have experienced. And know the love that I have received. God, it's my prayer tonight that they would come and experience that in their, in their own life. And Lord, for those of us that are Christians, that we never lose sight. God, of the hope that we should have and the joy that ought to spring out of our life into a lost and dying world. Help us, Lord, to live for you. Lead us now to a point of decision in our life, I pray. For it's in Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Brother Mike.